Welcome to this lecture on digital communication using GNU radio. My name is Kumar Appaya and I belong to the Department of Electrical Engineering, IIT Bombay. This lecture will be a continuation of our discussion on orthogonal frequency division multiplexing wherein we will discuss how equalization is greatly simplified when using OFTM. To recall our, to recall our previous discussion on OFDM, what we concluded is that if you look at OFDM as repetition of symbols combined with frequency shift, that is if you repeat B0 multiple times, B, the symbol B1 multiple times, but multiply them by appropriate vectors, then the resulting you know, waveform, so to speak, in the frequency domain exhibits a characteristic wherein B0 occupies a spectrum that is close to 0 hertz. B1 occupies a spectrum that is close to W upon 4 hertz, B2 occupies a spectrum that is close to W by 2 or minus W by 2 hertz and B3 occupies somewhere close to minus W upon 4 hertz. These are called subcarriers and these subcarriers follow a sync like pattern in the frequency domain and carry data. One remark that I would like to make is that you have to sample in the frequency domain exactly at this particular point. If you think about it, Sampling in the frequency domain is basically in time domain getting your frequencies exactly right. In other words, you must have performed your you know, receiver carrier calibration and carrier recovery phase estimation correctly for OFDM to be very effective. Otherwise, you may suffer from some inter-symbol interference because if you do not sample at the right point, you may get contribution from the neighboring symbols. Let us now continue. We were discussing that we can use the DFT or to be technically correct the inverse DFT matrix to take your symbols B0, B1, B2, etc. and convert them to a format where they occupy these narrowband subcarriers in the frequency domain. Now if you start increasing the number of subcarriers, you will see that the spectral footprint of those sync like pulses become narrower and they occupy a much narrower bandwidth yet you are able to parallelize. In this current picture again, we have split our bandwidth of minus W upon 2 to W upon 2 into 8 parallel OFDM streams and these 8 parallel OFDM streams are essentially allowing you to send, you, send this data at the same data rate, you know, your, your data rate is unchanged as it stands, yet you are able to put your data in parallel frequency bands. So in other words, B0 occupies close to 0 hertz. B1 in this case will occupy I believe close to, so if B4 B is close to W by 2, then I believe this should be W by um, 16, this is 2W by 16, 3W by 16, yeah, I think it should be W by 8. B1 occupies W by 8, B2 occupies W by 4, B3 occupies 3W by 8, B4 occupies W by 2. So it is like, this is like. and so on. And so in this particular instance, you have 8 subcarriers. These 8 subcarriers are re reflecting narrow band transmissions in the frequency domain. If you increase the number of subcarriers to something like 16, then again you the subcarriers become narrower and narrower. They can become very, very close in the frequency domain. One remark again, uh, this is something which we will not cover in this course, but something you should remember is that getting the frequency sampling wrong, meaning not calibrating the receiver frequency correctly can result in a significant amount of inter-symbol interference that reflects in the frequency domain. This inter-symbol interference that reflects in the frequency domain can significantly hinder your performance. That is something that you must remember. Now, we will remember, we will, you know, recall our DFT based picture. Technically, what we said is, you can use the inverse DFT matrix, which was that 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, j minus 1 minus j and so on to enable this kind of modulation, this should be n, sorry, enable the kind of modulation that you just saw, wherein your symbols were put in parallel frequency bins. So how do you do that? So we will now slightly alter the way we looked at it. It is the same thing but with just different notation. We will say that our data, we will collate 
into b0, b1, b2 up to bn minus 1. Let us say we take a single block. Our idea was to repeat b0, uh, repeat b0 multiple times. That is why b0 is multiplying the b0 is multiplying the all ones mate, you know column. b1 is also repeated n times, but being multiplied by e power j omega naught n. In this case, it is e power j 2 pi by n, e power j 4 pi by n. We are taking n point DF, IDFT that is. b2 is multiplied by e power j 4 pi by n, e power j 8 pi by n and so on. And finally, b n minus 1 is being multiplied by this particular vector. This is scaled by 1 by root n. This 1 by root n scaling is to ensure that this matrix is unitary. If you recollect from our previous lecture, we defined our W which is the inverse DFT matrix as 1 for the 4 case 1 1 I believe it was 1 j minus 1 minus j 1 minus 1 1 minus 1 and finally we had 1 minus j minus 1 j. We wrote W Hermitian also let us for posterity write it 1 1 1 1 1 minus j minus 1 j I am taking the conjugate 1 minus 1 1 minus 1 and I believe this should be 1 j minus 1 minus j and we said that W Hermitian W was 4 times identity. So, what I am going to do is I am going to just divide this by 1 by root 4 and divide this by 1 by root 4 and I get identity the 4 cross 4 identity. This 1 by root 4 is very very useful because it scales w so that w Hermitian times w is identity. Another thing is that the scaling also has another important use. This w Hermitian w being identity implies that you are not scaling the vector's energy. In other words, if you are multiplying by b, then the energy of b does not change. How so? Let us go back and see. So, if you see our x is w times b, where b is the, this particular vector which we have. Let us just work this out. Okay? So, suppose that my b vector is b0, b1, say b n minus 1. Let us actually evaluate expectation of norm b vector square what will it be? This is equal to expectation of B Hermitian times B which is equal to summation L runs from 0 to n minus 1 expectation of mod B L square. Why? Because B Hermitian B is just sum of the magnitude square of the elements. Now, since we assume that our symbols are generated IID with the same average energy, this is going to be n times E s, where E s is your signal energy. n times E s is the signal energy. Now, our x is w times b. The question which we are asking is, after doing this IDFT operation, are we using more power or less power? So, to do that, let us evaluate expectation of x Hermitian x. Okay, because that is summation of mod x i square, this is equal to expectation of, let us play a matrix trick, x is w b Hermitian w b. Okay. Now, here this is equal to expectation of b Hermitian w Hermitian w times b. But W is a fixed matrix, it is not statistical and what did you just show? You said W Hermitian W is identity, in fact identity n for the n cross n case. So, this is equal to expectation of P Hermitian B which not surprisingly is n times E s. This is very very useful result because if you now use this scaled version of W with the 1 by root 10, we have ensured that the energy usage does not change. In other words, the IDFT matrix in this particular form, you ensure that the energy usage does not change. I will give you a warning, in GNU radio, the DFT matrix has a scaling related uh, issue, you know, issue, not issue, it just scales the um, signal differently. 
you have to account for it, it's very easy. You just have to multiply by a factor, but just something to keep in mind that we will be using this particular DFT matrix picture because if you then have this property, w, you can check W Hermitian, W, W, W Hermitian is identity n, of course, in the under notation. It's much more convenient for us to do our analysis. In other words, if the budget for your signal power is ES in the transmitter, then the X which you get by multiplying B by this particular W is also you're going to use the same amount of energy per symbol. Now, since W is a unitary matrix, we just showed that X Hermitian X is equal to B Hermitian B, actually expect in expectation sense, of course, okay, will be equal to N times ES. Of course, if you use a symbol like QPSK, right? For QPSK, this will be true irrespective, but if you use something like QAM16 or something, you'll have to put an expectation. Now, X is the inverse DFT of B. Now, here is the key. We never spoke about how we can get back B from X at the receiver. Let us suppose that there is no channel and there is no noise. Then, since X is the DFT of B, all you need to do is, X is the IDFT of B rather, all you need to do is to take the DFT of X because the DFT and IDFT are lossless, inter you know, uh, lossless reversible operations. So, at the receiver, what you can do is you can just group N symbols, take the DFT, you will get back your B. Of course, there are some issues. You do not know what happens when there is noise. You do not know what happens when there is a channel. That is something which we will see. The bandwidth usage is nominally the same, the channel split into K or N narrow band sub, sub channels or sub carriers. But now let us see what happens when we have a channel, when we say channel, we have a convolution and we have noise addition. That is something which that we have to handle. So we will take a small detour and aside and remember the connection between the discrete Fourier transform and convolution. If you remember from your DSP, if you have two sequences, let us say Xn and Hn, if you take their endpoint DFTs and refer them to capital XK and capital HK respectively, when we say endpoint DFT, we take the endpoint DFT to be summation Xn e power minus j 2 pi k n upon capital N. Okay? So, it the capital XK and capital HK are defined for numbers between 0 and capital N minus 1. Now, if your yk is hk times xk, if you multiply the DFTs of two sequences, then the sequence that corresponds to is not the convolution, it is the so called circular convolution. That is why I have put a C. That means that whenever you perform in, in, in the traditional sense, if you use DTFT, if you multiply DTFTs of two sequences, then the inverse of that will be the convolution of those two sequences in the sequence domain. Unfortunately, over here, when you have DFTs that are being multiplied, then your resulting sequence is something which is circularly convolved. That is, your Yn is going to be summation L is equal to 0 to n minus 1, x L h n minus L mod n or you just swap h and x, it is the same thing. This is not the same as linear convolution. Now, let us go to our picture of OFDM. In the OFDM case, we took the IDFT, we then it underwent convolution with a channel. Now, the problem is that if you want to exploit this particular property of single tap equalization or just division based equalization, let us see, I am just saying that suppose your, you know, a, a, H is known and your Y is known, then to get X, you just need to do Y upon H, at least at the, for the, you know, something like a zero forcing equalizer that you just saw. Uh, you can just do y upon h or for MMSC you can do y upon some, uh, you know, function of h. The problem, however, is that this is valid only if you have circular convolution. But any practical channel that you saw when we were dealing with this MMSC and zero forcing equalizers performs linear convolution and not circular convolution. So what do we do? So see, since we want to use the DFT, IDFT property, we want yk is equal to xk times hk. We want that. But the, the natural way, the you know, nature is not giving you that. It just says, I am going to do linear convolution. So what can we do? 
the way to do it is we can actually fake circular convolution by including what is called a cyclic prefix. That is, we group our symbols in this manner b0, b1, b2 up to bn minus 1. We take the IDFT and we what we get we call x0, x1 up to xn minus 1. This is your uh, x vector so to speak. And we add a cyclic prefix of for the form xn minus 3, xn minus 2, xn minus 1. What does this achieve? Let us actually analyze this. So let us say that you have x0, x1, x2, x3. Let us take this. And let us suppose that you want to convolve this with h0, h1, h2. And you want circular convolution. How do we achieve this? To perform this circular convolution, what we will do is we will write x0 x1, x2, x3 and we will write h0 flipped, h0, h1, h2 and we will multiply and add. Now sadly over here h0 times x0, you should the linear convolution gives you h0 times x0 but the circular convolution will give you h0 times x0 plus h2 times x3 plus h1 times x2. Unfortunately, that is not there. So, what we can do is we can actually just modify our sequence to append this over here. If you append these over here and then perform the circular convolution in this re region, let us just look at the output in this region. You are going to have h0, x0 plus h1 x3 plus h2 x2. This is exactly the output of the circular convolution that you want. Let us look at this one also. We have to shift this by 1. So, we will get h0 x1. A linear convolution would also have given you h1 x0, no problem. But a circular convolution will need, will give you h2 times x3. So, by prepending these, you are able to get the circular convolution in this regime and we will ignore this part. Therefore, the way we achieve this circular convolution in the OFDM cases, let us say you have x0, x1, x2, x3. Then you have the next symbol, I am deliberately adding a gap, let us say x prime 0, the next group of symbols, you know, the next b's, x prime 1, x prime 2, x prime 3. What you do is you take you take these, let us say uh, two of these, okay, just uh, for a, an example, let us say you take these and you prepend them over here. Similarly, you take these x2 prime, x3 prime and prepend them over here. Sorry about this. Then, as you perform the convolution with h, your h, h2, h1, h0 moves, 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 your h0, h1, h2, you ignore the convolution result at these points, just take these. You again ignore the convolution result at these points and just take these. These points will be circularly convolved. This is the trick that we play. And by playing this trick, of course, you have to prepend some amount of data to the beginning. This, of course, results in an overhead, meaning you are repeating symbols. It is not like you get something for free. For OFDM, if you are going to use the cyclic prefix, let us say in this case we are using three symbols. Earlier, in n time, if you have n symbols, you are sending them in n time instances. In this case, for n symbols, you are sending them in n plus 3 samples, n plus 3 time instances. So, your overhead is actually n upon n plus 3 or rather the efficiency is n upon n plus 3 because you are reducing the data rate ever so slightly. 
This is one of the reasons why if you look at the FFT size N in OFDM, the N is essentially chosen to be as large as possible for supporting the data rate and you choose the cyclic prefix length to be close to or just slightly above the expected channel length in number of taps. For example, if you have a three tap channel H0, H1, H2, your cyclic prefix needs to be at least two in length. Typically, you'll choose more because if you then have to run your system in an environment where there are more taps needed, then you don't want it to fail, right? So the circular convolution produces overhead and in fact, let's say that, you know, I can define a term called, uh, let's say, OFDM's efficiency. This is not a very standard term. Okay. This is equal to, you can say, N upon N plus CP length. Or alternately, the overhead is CP length In, in, you can think of this as a fraction or in percentage. So the OFDM efficiency is n upon n plus CP length, meaning you want your n to be much larger than CP length or CP length to be much smaller than n. Of course, CP length has to be chosen to be length of channel, typically length of channel minus 1. That is something to keep in mind. So the key idea that we are doing is we are taking the cyclic prefix and by taking the cyclic prefix, even after you convolve with the channel, you can ignore the part that comes out, the y that comes out after convolution from the channel just previous to this. Actually, this is, let's say, y prime n minus 2, n minus 3, and take only this part. This part is circularly convolved. That is, within the part after the cyclic prefix at the receiver, you have circular convolution. What does that give you? If you do this, then if you take the DFT of this part, which I have highlighted, then you are going to get yk, which is hk times xk, which as we promised is giving you a flat channel. In other words, if you manage to do this cyclic prefix based, uh, you know, um, extra effort, the resulting uh, yk you get has undergone just multiplication by hk, which is a much simpler equalization problem because you just have to multiply or divide by a single number. Let's say it's MMSC or you know, let's say it's a 0 to 0 forcing, you can come up with a simpler equalization in this particular approach. That's the key idea. One thing we have not seen is the effect of noise. That is something which we will address now. The overall model is HN convolution WN, sorry, HN convolution XN plus WN is what we have. If we consider vectors of the form uh, W, you know, y is, y is equal to y0, y1 up to yn minus 1 transpose and so on. And similarly for x, okay. If you assume an appropriate cyclic prefix, so whenever we say appropriate cyclic prefix, we say that the cyclic prefix length is long enough so that the impact of the channels has been converted to a circular convolution within the region of interest. Then if you now choose the W which we chose earlier, the W was the IDFT matrix scaled so that W Hermitian W was identity. At the receiver, if you do W Hermitian Y, Y is only the part after the cyclic prefix, you get W Hermitian H circular convolution X. Now H circular convolution X, if you take the DFT of that, you get HKXK. Now what about W Hermitian W? Now that is something which we call W prime, but let's look at what W Hermitian W is. Let's say our W is W0, W1, I'll call it noise, W n minus 1, and this is distributed as complex normal with mean 0, and let's say uh, we will assume identity covariance. It's scaled. That is, you don't have sigma square i because I've taken the sigma square as a scaling. I'm just going to scale my ES so that ES by sigma square is my new ES. In this case, my noise is W. If I do W Hermitian times W and call it W prime, let's look at the covariance of W prime. Expectation of W times W prime times W prime Hermitian is equal to, we'll play the same trick as we did earlier. W prime W, W Hermitian, 
Hermitians, sorry, this will be W Hermitian, W, W Hermitian, W, okay. Let me just redo this carefully. Yeah, W prime is W Hermitian, W. So, this is W Hermitian, W, W Hermitian, okay. Now, since this W is a fixed matrix, this is equal to W Hermitian times expectation of W W Hermitian times W, but this is identity as we saw here. So, this is equal to W Hermitian W, which is equal to identity of the same size. In other words, taking the DFT of the noise results in a noise sequence that is the same distribution. In other words, because of the fact that this scale DFT matrix is just a circular, you know, it is just like a rotation matrix, the noise variance does not change. Therefore, this WK are actually IID because I chose my W as IID, they have the same variance as W. This is the key. Uh, this is true only in the case where your W has a covariance which has some scaled version of identity, which is what we are going to consider. So, W prime K has the same variance of WN and it is IID just like WN. Therefore, this is actually something like a very plain single tab scaling additive white Gaussian noise channel and it is very, very easy and simple to handle. Therefore, you are able to now bring back all the tools that you learned except that it is very, very simplified because you just have a single tab. It is not a filter. Your OFDM has converted this convolution filter to a channel like this. Of course, there are some pr prices you have paid for like cyclic prefix and you know uh, a stranger kind of frequency footprint, but it is very, very easy to implement a receiver for this if you look at the trade-offs. So, let us summarize what we have learned. Wideband channels can be parallelized for simple equalization. You just want to put your data in parallel frequency bands and using the DFT or an IDFT is a nice way to make the channels parallel, channels parallel. One key requirement is that we need circular convolution and this is enabled by using the cyclic prefix that is an overhead and because of its ease of implementation and several advantages, OFDM is used in several modern wireless standards and in fact all standards like Wi-Fi, LTE use some variant of OFDM and several wired communication also such as ADSL uh, use a variant of OFDM called uh, discrete multitone and OFDM has seen a lot of success in several wireless standards as well. In the next lecture, we will go through a couple of examples of implementing OFDM on GNU radio that will make the concepts very clear. Thank you.